Good morning. I'm Chip Hardwick. I am the executive of the Synod of the Covenant, and I want to welcome you to this preaching workshop, our monthly preaching workshop. Um, we're so glad you could be here, and let's pray to start out our time together. Gracious God, thank you so much for calling us to share your word in so many different ways in our lives. Um, we pray now, oh God, that you would strengthen our preaching lives together, that um, through Jake's presentation, that we would be enlivened and we would be sharpened and we would come out of this able to proclaim your grace and love for the world better than we are now. So thank you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to um, just bring you up to date on a few things that are happening at the Senate of the Covenant before I turn it over to Jake. So um, let me share my screen and I'll give you this rundown. Carmen, can you see that? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Yeah. Wanna let you know that we have an advanced boundaries training that's just coming up next week. So if you take boundaries training, the intro is not, um, it, is, it is not a requirement to take the advanced training. Um, the intro is pretty much exactly what LeaderWise offered to us last year. So if you took that and need to take it again, you'll probably be more interested in the advanced boundaries training that's coming up next week. I'm looking forward to taking that myself. And I hope some of you will join in for that. And um, there's no cost to you for that. It's covered by your presbytery and your synod. I have a quick question about that. Um, yes. I never received the documentation uh, for the training uh, last fall. So does that mean I've got to retake it again? Um, I don't think so. Could you email me? I'll put my email in the chat. If you can send me an email, I'll be glad to ask our office manager to look into it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Um, the, our higher education scholarships, the applications are due on May 15th. So that's just around the corner. These are um, scholarships for students in vocational school or in associate's degrees, undergrad degrees um, of any major for those and then students pursuing their first master's in theology. And we would love to have people apply. And so if you have students in your lives um, that are in any of those programs, they just need to be a member of a church from the Synod of the Covenant and um, they can apply. They do not need to be going to school within the Synod of the Covenant. It doesn't need to be a Presbyterian college or institution, just any student that's in any one of those programs. We would be glad to um, support them with a scholarship uh, if they apply. Also want to let you know that the, our grants program, the applications will be up today. Uh, they're not due until September 30th, but I, um, we want to get as many applications as we can. So I wanted to let you know about that now. Um, these are for congregational work towards congregational vitality or against structural racism or systemic poverty, which are of course the goals of the Matthew 25 movement. Um, also, you might check with your um, Presbytery exec to see if your presbytery is participating in a program that the Synod is offering for coaching. We are partnering with Compass Coaching to provide coaching for um, CREs and pastors. Um, the, it's, a, it's a partnership between the Synods and the presbyteries. And um, if you talk to your presbytery exec, you may be able to take advantage of that. So I want to let you know about that program. It's just um, brand new. We ran a pilot program last year and this year we're extending the, um, the opportunity to all the presbyteries to participate. Then finally, I wanna let you know about the um, preaching workshops that are coming up. Today, we'll have Jake Myers. If you're not here to see Jake Myers or here for a, um, here for a preaching workshop, you may be in the wrong place, but we're glad you could all introduce Jake more fully in just a second. But I wanna let you know who's coming, Teresa Fry Brown from the Candler School of Theology of Emory, is coming next month. She's will be leading on Osei Can You See Using Imagery in a Visually Saturated World. We'll take July off and then in August we'll have Kim Wagner from the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. She's going to be speaking on preaching in the wake of trauma. Then in September Sally Brown from Princeton Seminary recently retired. Sunday Sermons for Monday's World. That's her most recent mm. book. And then in October, I'll lead a workshop on preaching for Advent 2022. And then November, Luke Powery from Duke University, um, preaching in the Valley of Dry Bones. So I hope you'll make plans to attend all of those. 
You can find out information about all of these from our website, synodofthecovenant.org. You don't get our newsletter. It's the best way to hear about things ahead of time. You can subscribe to this website. You can also find and follow us on Facebook or search and subscribe to us on YouTube. And here's my contact information, which I'll also put in the chat. Nobody else gets my voicemail messages and nobody else reads my email. So I'd be glad to hear from you if, um, if you have anything particularly for me about ways that we can support you and your churches. We at the Synod really want to support the leaders throughout our presbyteries. And um, that's why we're here today. So let me introduce to you Jake Myers. Jake is our leader today. And Jake is, um, I'll tell you the personal side first. I got to know Jake. I think Jake, you might have still been in the PhD program when we met, um, or you might have just started preaching at Columbia. I'm not sure uh, where, but I remember we went to for drinks um, when the Academy of Homiletics was in Atlanta. Uh, it was, it might've been the same night that my car got booted. I'm not sure, but my car got booted during that event too. But I, I've been following you ever since then. I'm really grateful for you to lead us today. Uh, let me tell you the, um, the, um, the more formal things about Jake. He is the um, Wade P. Huey Jr. Associate Professor of Homiletics at Columbia Seminary. He's interested in homiletical theories and theologies, continental philosophies, especially post-structuralism, existentialism, and phenomenology. There might be a test at the end to see um, how well we can express ourselves in those ways. And the emerging expressions of faith and practice in postmodern, post-Christian contexts. Um, he's authored and co-authored numerous essays and articles for journeys such as Theology Today, Literature and Theology, Homiletic, and Worship. His book publications include the following, Making Love with Scripture, Why the Bible Doesn't Mean How You Think It Means, Preaching Must Die, Troubling Homiletical Theology, Curating Church, Strategies for Innovative Worship, In Tongues of Mortals and Angels, A Deconstructive Theology of God Talk, co-authored with Eric Barreto and Nikki Young, and finally, Stand Up Preaching, Homiletical Insights for Contemporary Comedians, from Contemporary Comedians. Um, Jake received his BA in the <laughs> Philosophy from Gardner Webb, then Div from Princeton Seminary, and his PhD in Person, Community, and Religious Life from Emory University, and he's an ordained pastor in the PCUSA. So let's give Jake some happy hands as we um, welcome him here and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Chip. Uh, one, one word of correction there. We actually met when I was an MDiv student and you were a PhD student at Princeton. And, and I remember like he would walk into the room and there would be this like hush, you know, like, oh wow, he's in the PhD program. So it's, it's exciting to be able to follow your career, Chip, and to, to have this opportunity to share uh, with all these folks here today. There's a lot of, a lot of great folks. Um, I, I know a few of you, but I'll get to know some of you later. So let me start sharing my screen so that you can see some visuals. All right, are y'all able to see that? You are, great. All right, so my talk today is on uh, preaching jokes to power, and uh, this comes uh, out of a book that I have just finished, and it will be out they told me at the end of the summer or the early fall called Stand Up Preaching and the subtitle is Homiletical Insights from Contemporary Comedians. And uh, this has been such a fun book to write. I hope if you get a chance that you'll check it out. Uh, a big part of my work has, has been to try to learn from other disciplines that share a lot of similarities with what we do as preachers. Uh, so my book Curating Church, I looked at the, the work of art curators and the ways in which they have to, to curate and organize and to think about how they would display certain pieces of art to create certain effects. And so uh, that was a fine deep dive into the world of art, art theory and art curation. This has been a deep dive and a really deep dive during the pandemic into the world of stand-up comedy. Uh, so I hope you'll check that out if you get a chance. Uh, let me talk really quickly about our outline, what I'm, what I'm hoping that we'll, we'll cover today. Uh, the key question that kind of drives uh, this, this conversation for me is this. Can preachers employ the humorous and the comical to spur more just ways of being, believing, and belonging in their sermons? So that's the key question that kind of drives the book. It's going to drive some of this conversation. Uh, let me say up front that 
I've spent the last uh, couple of years nerding out about comedy theory and stand-up comedy. So I'm going to intersperse some times for us to talk together because that really is what I want to hear about is are the ways in which there's an intersection between this work that I've done and, and the work that you all are doing in your respective congregational contexts. So we'll start with an opening reflection. Uh, we'll look at some disclaimers that, that I want to get out of the way uh, just before we think about even trying to appropriate work from stand-up comedy in, in our sermons. Uh, I want to talk about a terminological distinction between the humorous and the comical. And then we'll talk a little bit about the debate over comedy's uh, effectiveness, like, you know, whether there's a debate, whether you can tell jokes that actually lead people to change uh, their ways of being in the world. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then uh, with whatever time we have left, uh, we'll look at some exemplars uh, that I look at in my book, and you probably have others that you would want to talk about, uh, but actual stand-up comics who are doing this kind of work in different ways and to think about how we can learn from their respective approaches. All right, so my, my opening question is this. Have you ever heard a joke that spurred you to believe or behave differently? See, I have this, I have this hypothesis, and it's this. Stand-up comedy both enthralls and terrifies preachers. And, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but this, this is why. Uh, we look at the work of stand-up comics, and we see so much overlap between what they're doing and what we do. Uh, for the most part, you have a lone person on a stage talking to an audience who is more or less interested in what the, the speaker has to say. Uh, we use microphones. We uh, have some ends, some, some goal to what we're trying to say. You know, for, for comics, a lot of it is to lead people to laugh. Uh, for us, we're hopefully leading people to, you know, have a deeper relationship with God and Jesus Christ, to participate in God's mission in the world, uh, any, any number of our functions that might, might arise from our sermons. But at the same time, there are a lot of differences. Um, I don't know about your preaching, but when I preach and, and I look to see the reactions that I'm receiving, I'm not getting the same kind of feedback that, that comics get in the comedy clubs. Uh, nobody has ever fallen out of their chairs uh, laughing at any of my, my jokes. Uh, uh, so the, the, the audience is a little bit different. And, and some of this is good, right? Uh, I have never been heckled in the pulpit. Uh, hopefully you have never been heckled. Uh, the, the decorum of church life is a little bit uh, more restrictive uh, for the audience than it is in comedy clubs. Uh, hopefully nobody's ever slapped you uh, from something that you've said in, in the pulpit, uh, but maybe you have, like, you know, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, comedy scholar Sophie Quick uh, notes uh, how important the atmosphere of the comedy club is to the, the audience's reception of the comic's point of view, and this insight really kind of drives this question for me. So she writes that stand-up combines genuine challenge with a relaxed approach to the concern for truth and a relaxation of everyday standards of decency. Now, in a lot of the churches I've been a part of, the, the standards of decency are actually elevated than they are in the regular world. So this is another point of difference where we have on the one hand, um, you know, folks are, um, you know, in the comedy clubs, they're kind of like holding in abeyance those typical rules of what polite behavior would be, certain topics that would be taboo at work, uh, in church, are open game for, for comics, whereas in church, uh, th there are certain things, that, certain subjects that uh, I know that I rarely talk about that because of this concern for the audience and, and, and the ethos of, of the general, general place. Um, so let's talk for a little bit about, um, about this opening question, right? whether you have ever heard a joke that spurred you to behave or to believe differently. And I will stop sharing so that I can see your lovely faces. All right, so just jump in. Tell me, have you ever had this experience? Jake, I once heard a joke from the comic Emo Phillips that changed my life. Mm -hmm. He said, I've always thought of my body as a temple or at least a moderately well-run Presbyterian youth center. Did, did, did that cause you to think differently about your, your body or? Mm -hmm. I wanted to take care of myself more. Wow, that's great. Uh, I would say that anything that, uh, almost anything that Robin Williams did. Mm. 
I can't think of anything in particular at the moment, but uh, a lot of it, while I'm sitting there and, and listening to his routines, uh, uh, helped me to think differently. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, he was in a league of his own, wasn't he? As a as a comic, and and his ability to just off the cuff to engage, uh, like there's times when he would just read the newspaper and do a whole set where he's just reading the newspaper, and it's yeah right. hilarious. <laughs> and I admit, sometimes I try to uh, emulate that and uh, go off the cuff, and uh, that's when uh, I don't get slapped at the uh, during the sermon, but. Good. uh get attacked afterwards <laughs> yeah yeah emails right you know uh, or, or just uh the head of the chair of uh the personnel committee saying uh we need to talk yes <laughs> yes i've heard that conversation many times in my, my ministry <laughs> i just say um maybe not jokes in particular although i'm old enough to remember george carlin right and certainly his his approach, you know, um, very much flips what we accept as, you know, reality. Um, and I'm thinking about people like Hannah Gatsby or An uh, Ansi Ansari, who have more of a narrative form um, that I just am so impressed, right? So you start out with something funny at the beginning and you carry that and then the punchline really isn't until, or the point really isn't until 10, 12, 14 minutes later. Yeah. Uh, I just am so impressed with their work. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. I, that, that's been my experience as well. And I have a chapter on Hannah Gadsby in my book. And uh, Aziz Ansari, is, he's a really interesting character because he's challenging certain you know, uh, structural injustices, but then he kind of had this, this controversy that emerged a few years ago. And it's interesting the way that he handled that. Uh, versus the way that people like Louis C.K. have handled uh, a similar similar issues, um, and and that's what I'm really excited about. It's this idea of the callback. So there's a joke uh, early in the set, and everybody laughs, but then that joke is kind of it kind of is wa working underground, and then at the very end it gets you, and you're like, oh wow, I'm laughing, but I'm also thinking, and 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 that that's been my experience as well with with good jokes, with good comedy. Thank you for that. I liked the cartoon from Frank and Ernest, and there was a man laying on a couch, just kind of sleeping. There's a boy standing right beside him, and he says, I want to follow in your footsteps. When are you going to start making some? Yeah, did that cause you to, to change anything in your life? Make some more footsteps. Mm. Thanks, Herb. All right. Well, thank you for sharing those. Uh, and, and that's that's the hope, right? Is is that um, we would be able to employ these uh, these techniques to to lead people to see the world differently, to you know, engage the world more faithfully, uh, follow God more faithfully. And, you know, Augustine, who uh, wrote the first homiletics textbook, you know, on Christian doctrine, he said that he got this from Cicero, but he said that there are kind of three goals of, of preaching. You know, we preach to teach, we can preach to delight, and we can preach to persuade. And, and I think that those three things are, are always operative in the work that we do as, as, as proclaimers of God's word. And, and I don't know that all comics care so much about the the persuading or the teaching part some of it's just delight right uh, but i'm really interested in the people who are trying to do all three uh, people who are using comedy to engage their audience and to help them see the world differently and to expose systems of inequity that, that we see and and to to challenge those structures uh, by with the tool of comedy so uh, before we get too far ahead, I, I, ha I have a few disclaimers. I, I have some questions that I want us to think about uh, before we before we get too excited about you know going all in on using stand up in our preaching. For most of church history, the standard sermonic situation has been that of a serious person proclaiming serious words in a serious way. And so when we think about stand-up comedy, which seems to be the opposite of serious, 
um, that's something that we have to kind of hold in, in, in front of our uh, front of our minds about whether our efforts to employ humor and, and, the, and the comical in our sermons will cause people to think that we don't take this task as seriously as, as, as we do. And, and, and this, is, this is a challenge. You know, you have somebody like Hannah Gadsby. Uh, I actually got to see her this weekend here in Atlanta. Uh, brilliant comic, flawless in her structure and her delivery. It was, it was superb. But she doesn't have to, you know, bury someone's mom the next day. You know, she, she doesn't have to marry someone's kids the following weekend. So we have this weird situation, you know, as, as, as preachers in that our, the discursive moment that happens on sun, Sunday morning for most of us isn't the only thing that we do. And something I tell my students all the time is that whenever we're preaching, we're never not also pastoring. So I, I want us to hold that, that in our minds as we, we kind of move forward. Um, specifically, uh, when, when we think about, you know, using jokes in the pulpit, uh, we've already named uh, some of the, the challenges, you know, the, the you, know, you know, head of the session is pulling us aside, that, you know, someone on the deacon, you know, board is pulling us aside, concerned about something that we said. And that's just something that is going to go along with it. You know, anytime you employ humor in the, in the sermon, it is a high risk, high reward endeavor. Right. There are certain benefits that we'll talk about, but there are certain dangers or risks that, that go along with that. And, and specifically, I want to look at a few. Have you weighed the risks of homiletical humor against your preaching context? Some, for some congregations, there's more of a light spirit. Uh, you know, folks are more eager to, uh, to laugh. They're more uh, quick to, to laugh, to engage uh, things in current events. There are certain topics that would be allowed into the conversation uh, in the church, others that would be absolutely taboo. So one of the things we have to do is to think about how all the stuff we're going to talk about today might apply to your homiletical context. Uh, you know, I, I don't want you to, you know, take a joke that you heard here and then try it on Sunday and say, well, hey, Jake Myers at Columbia Seminary said that, that I, I can do this. It's like, no, no, you have to think about your context. And if, as you study the work of stand-up comics, a lot of what they're doing is they're trying out jokes in different, different settings. So before it makes it to Netflix or to HBO or to Comedy Central, they've tried these jokes in a number of different contexts because a joke that might just you know, bring down the house in Atlanta might totally bomb in Des Moines. So it's, it's thinking about who their audience is and, and, and how to, to modulate that. Another question is, uh, are you willing to show your congregation who you really are? You know, Sigmund Freud was the first to identify that a lot of our unconscious uh, biases and desires and fears come out of, of our comedy. In fact, he linked jokes and dreams as similar uh, kind of um, points of revelation of who we, we truly are underneath. And that can be risky, especially if we're gonna try a joke more extemporaneously, right? If we haven't thought about it in advance. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a risky thing, and, and maybe you've had this experience, you know, at a dinner party, maybe a couple glasses of wine, and you say a joke that you think is really funny, and then you realize, like, oh, wow, this is revealing something about me that I didn't really want everybody to know about. So, so that's something we have to bear in mind. Another thing is, are you willing to be misunderstood? You know, people show up to a comedy club, and they're expecting jokes. They're expecting to laugh, right? They're expecting some, some delight to, to emerge. And, and they're probably, you know, bracing themselves to be challenged in some ways. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm vegan, and so anytime a stand-up comic starts to talk about it, I just kind of like slump down in my seat a little bit more. I'm like, oh gosh, what are they going to say about the vegans? Uh, and as a Christian, right, you know, I, I have that, that same, <laughs> same thing, you know, when, you know, George Carlin was mentioned, you know, he was vicious against the church, but he was also right in a lot of ways. And and so that's something that we run the risk of doing is, is the intention behind our joke. Like we know what it is, but the intention and the effect or the impact don't always line up. So we need to keep that in mind. Another thing is, are you willing to do more work? It is hard work to write jokes. It is hard work to, to arrange your sermon in a way that the, the punchline really grabs hold of, of folks and, and achieves those ends that we have. 
you know, for most of us, we're preaching, you know, 48, you know, weeks out of the year and you preach a sermon and then, then what do you have to do? You have to jump right into the next sermon. And that's really different from the work of stand-up comics where they, they do a single set of jokes and they're trying them out in lots of different contexts with lots of different people. So the material itself, I mean, even as they were refining it and tweaking it, and they're, you know, depending upon audience feedback to decide, you know, how far they go with a certain joke. Um, you know, we, uh, if we have an amazing story that's so funny and we tell it, when we, once we tell it, it's over, right? We can't just keep telling that story over and over again. So that means if we want to engage uh, this, this kind of homiletical comical work in our preaching, it's going to require a lot of extra time. Uh, so much of a good joke is based on our delivery. So our timing has to be right. That's something that's going to take extra time and work for us. Um, most uh, people in the PCUSA, a lot of us learn to preach with manuscripts. If you ever try to read a joke to somebody, uh, maybe they'll laugh, but they're not going to laugh the same way they would as if you were like, they could see your eyes, they could see your face animated and, and all of those things. So taking that extra time to memorize a joke or a bit, that's going to require more for us from us. And then the last question is, are you willing to lose your job? Now, I have a wonderful tenure track position here at Columbia Seminary. So if I go in to one of your churches and I guess preach and I say something that offends somebody, um, maybe they'll say something to me. But, you know, my experience is when I was in pastoral ministry, people were far less reticent to tell me uh, how they felt about the things I was saying than they do when I'm a guest preacher. Uh, but I don't want to minimize this this thing like one joke could you know lead to losing your job and and that's something i've been so uh uh thankful for the work of frank thomas at christian theological seminary and his work on preaching dangerous sermons because he he acknowledges this this call to challenge systems of injustice in our world that goes right along with the danger that that's concomitant with that so uh, these are some of the questions that I, that I want to make sure that we have on the table uh, before we jump too deeply into, into the work today. All right, let me talk about uh, a few terminological distinctions. Um, and, and the distinctions I'm drawing are between the humorous and the comical. And the, the reason that I, I have found this necessary is because comedy scholars and humor study scholars use all kinds of different language to signify the same thing. Um, the, the kind of comedy that I was really interested in is the kind of comedy that challenges, uh, you know, injustice in the world that, that leads people to, to see themselves differently in relationship to others. And what a lot of comedy scholars do is they modify the word humor. So Rebecca Crafting, for instance, uh, she differentiates between humor and charged humor. So charged humor is that humor that, that, that you know, that punches up, that challenges the 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 powers and principalities. Uh, Cynthia and Julie Willett, who are another team of comedy scholars, they talk about progressive humor. And this would be humor that is critiquing, you know, uh, societal injustices. And uh, my friend Chuck Campbell, who just retired from Duke Divinity School, uh, in his writing, he talks about risky humor. And, and I think he means risky in two ways, right? It's the risks that go along with the things that I just was talking about. But but also it's, it's, it's taking a risk to challenge these, these powers and, and principalities. Um, so the, the way that I tend to think of these, these, the humorous and the comical is not as a binary, right? They're, they're not opposite because I think all the best standup like is also producing humor. It's causing us to laugh, but the comical is doing the humorous plus a little bit more, right? It, it's, the, it's the comical that I think is challenging these uh, ideological assumptions that's, that's pressing against uh, the domination of one group of people over other groups of people. So I thought it would be helpful to kind of lay out the differences between these things, uh, just so that we can kind of have a sense of, of how they work because contemporary standup comedy amalgamates these two ancient forms of discourse. So on the one hand, you have humor, which is connected with the, the idea of humus or where we get the word humid. Um, so it has like it, it, etym etymologically, it has to do with like uh, the body, you know, and the, the the you know the moisture that we have. You know, they talked about the four humors is a medical terminology back in you know uh, Plato and Aristotle's time. 
And, and those all had to do with liquids in the body that determined our personality types. So uh, comedy comes um, from two Greek words. One is komo, which is uh, the word for a revel or a festival, and uh, iodos, which is a singer or a poet. So it already, like at the beginning, uh, has this, uh, this connection with the social, whereas the humus or, or humor is, it tends to be more associated with the body and its uh, many vicissitudes and <laughs> challenges. Uh, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, who was a, a French uh, literary scholar, he talked about humor being connected to the material bodily lower stratum. So down here, so so much you know, comedy has to deal with you know sex and you know uh, excrement <laughs> in in some in some ways. Uh, whereas the the comedy, the social uh, is is what we might use to designate the the way that the individual is situated within a larger community. So it talks about the structures and systems uh, that are at play. Uh, humor tends to be more personal in nature. So in that we have a lot of like faux pas, you know, uh, embarrassing things that we do, um, you know, fart jokes, sex jokes, like those tend to be connected with humor that are in a lot of stand-up comedy, I'm sure you know. And then um, the, the comedy, the, the comical tends to be more political in nature. So this is where, um, you know, a, a stand-up comic might, you know, challenge systemic racism, heterosexism, or gerrymandering, you know, thinking about, you know, those structures and systems. Um, just as, as a few quick examples uh, of these, uh, some exemplars of the humor would be Jim Gaffigan. Uh, you know, nobody hears a Jim Gaffigan comedy set and then leaves thinking like, okay, now I'm going to make the world a better place, right? He's, you know, it, it's just pure delight. Uh, Seinfeld does this. Ellen, you know, even though, you know, there's a political bent to her uh, identity as a comic, most of her joke is really aimed at, at causing people to laugh. And Stephen Colbert, I'd put him in this link you know, in this list, because uh, a lot of his jokes, uh, even as even as they're, they're very political, they're often challenging the, you know, the, they're making, he was making fun of Trump, he was, you know, making fun of, you know, George Bush's, you know, gaffes. Um, so that, that's where I would put humor. And then uh, on the comical side, I would, you know, think about people like Moms Mabley, uh, Sarah Silverman, Hassan Minaj, and John Oliver, uh, where they're using humor, like they're, they're making us laugh, but they're also making us think. And there are, there's also a, an ideological bent to what they're trying to do. Um, you know, so the humorist tends to aim at laughter, and then the comical is it aims at laughter plus critique. So this would be the closest, I think, to our idea of metanoia, right? A new interchanging of our minds. Um, and, and then all, lastly, the, the humorist and the comical are connected with different theories of laughter. Uh, I don't want to get too in the weeds with all that, but uh, largely the superiority theory is the idea that we laugh at things because it makes us feel better about ourselves. So when we, when you hear a joke about a certain group of people or a certain person, and we say like, oh, wow, look how dumb, how silly, how ridiculous that person is, we, we take a little something for ourselves and it makes us feel better. Like, at least we're not that. On the other side, the, the, the comical tends to draw upon the, the incongruity theory, the idea that, that laughter emerges when these two things uh, are incongruous with one another. And it's in that tension, our minds are trying to reconcile these things. And uh, then there's this burst that comes out, which is, which is laughter. So, so those are some just different uh, ways that I've, I've found helpful to kind of differentiate these two things. And, and hope, hopefully that, that's helpful. But let me underscore, this is not a binary. It's not either or, but the comical is always uh, you know, in, engaging with humor and, and, and doing that. All right, so I, I wanna ask us an, another set of questions just to kind of get the conversation uh, going. And uh, the question has to do, these two questions are, how have you employed the humorous and or the comical uh, in your preaching? I'd love to hear about you know, your experiences trying this stuff. And uh, how have these discursive strategies served your homiletical goals? So I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can see one another again. Uh, so yeah, just talk a little bit. Tell me what, when have you tried this? Um, and you can tell success stories or failure stories. You know, this is a space among friends. <laughs> I know it's being recorded and it'll be on YouTube one day. So maybe we should bear that in mind as we're talking about it. But I'd, lo I'd love to hear your experiences. Talk to me. I have um, um, used humor a lot um, throughout my life and not just uh, through the church. Um, and I started doing it through provocative sermon titles. Mm, yeah. like shout out to a prostitute 
um, let's get naked, um, you know, things like that, and then go in uh, to teaching. But I found that what you said earlier in terms of knowing the context or the people that you're speaking to is huge. Um, yeah. But it's almost like I people have this expectation that I'm going to be funny even in a funeral. Mm. And so I incorporate humor and comedy into, into funerals because um, we take life so seriously, everybody needs to laugh. Yeah. Everybody needs to, you know, uh, take a break and finding a, a classy way to do that uh, in the midst of someone's worst time of their life. Um, I think is is God said and useful. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Carmen. That, that that that's ex exactly what I was I was thinking. Like, and, and one of the things is funny. Whenever homileticians have in the, in the history of of homiletics have talked about the use of humor, uh, most of it has been disparaging. Like, don't ever try this because it it would detract from the sanctity of the preaching moment. Uh, but but one of the things is they they always say like. If you're not a funny person, then don't try to tell jokes in the sermon. But if your natural disposition or orientation to the world is one of humor, then absolutely, you know, bring that into your into your preaching. Uh, and I love the use of titles, you know, the church marquee, you know, uh, and I, I, I share that like my book titles. I always try to, you know, have a little bit of something that's provocative, but it's also usually double entendres is, is, is my favorite uh, form of doing that. So thank you, Carmen. Philip, I, I found a, a couple of things. One is telling jokes never works mm -hmm. for me, but telling stories does work. Oh, yeah. And and so, uh, I mean, it's not like I'm intentionally being humorous. I think I'm more just being authentic because mm -hmm. people like the stories about me and and something about something stupid I've done or, you know, some, something like that. And here's the other thing I found that after people laugh, the next thing I say, everyone is listening mm. after, right. after something like that. And they're laughing out loud. Then the next moment, whatever my point is, that's what I want to say it. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. We're going to talk about that in, in just a minute. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and and I also have had the same experience, like, as I've been doing this, I thought, boy, I need to need to try some of this stuff. And it, first of all, it's really hard <laughs> to write a joke, but but uh, people aren't primed to hear a joke. So it's there, there's always this like, wait, was that a joke or is he being serious? And uh, and I've also found that just allowing just my natural personality to come through the sermon and use narratives I have a whole chapter in my book on the use of stories and what preachers can learn uh, from stand-up comics about that. So yeah, yeah. that'd be great because it's it's when you tell them an unexpected ending that they laugh. Like yeah. uh, so, uh, when General Assembly met in Detroit, Craig Barnes, the president of Princeton Seminary, came to my came to our church and preached, and I was going to introduce him because I was in the same class at Princeton as Craig Barnes. So I said Craig Barnes and I were in the same class. And I, I knew that Craig was a very diligent student. He was always going to class. And I know that after class, he loved the library. And he would go to the library and spend hours and hours in the library. Craig was always in class and always is, was in the library, which explains why, why when I was at Princeton Seminary, I never met him. <laughs> and, you know, it's just the unexpected line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's great because and a big part of humor is self-deprecatory right so nobody wants to hear someone telling a joke where they're telling you how amazing and awesome they are and it's a problem in our preaching if we're always the hero in, in our stories right so that's an excellent illustration chip jake this was really helpful for me and i so wish that i had heard your presentation before i preached one easter in a new call where um, i used um, a bodily function joke, which I thought was quite funny and people thought was quite offensive. My, um, my great aunt, Dean, had lived in a farmhouse where they had um, 
changed one of the bedrooms into a bathroom. So it was this gigantic bathroom. And then she moved into an apartment where she said the bathroom was so small, you either went in frontwards or backwards, depending on what you were doing. And um, I love my Aunt Dean. I think that's really funny. And um, people on Easter Sunday did not find it funny. And well, th it's not that they didn't laugh, they laughed, but they didn't find it appropriate. And really when I dug down with um, somebody who called to yell at me, um, I learned really that um, he and others thought it was be beneath the dignity of the pulpit. Yeah. And, and that was really helpful for me to learn. I wish I had heard your um, presentation ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, thank you for naming that. And, and some of it, you know, there's a, especially in a new call, we're, we're testing the waters, right? We're seeing, you know, uh, how much Bible do we need to put into our sermons? How many stories do we want to put in our sermons? You know, what, you know, what are the ends of our sermon? Are, like, do people expect to be called to participate in God's mission in your community? Or is it more about teaching? Uh, so yeah, all that stuff is, is so important. Becky. Hi, Jake. Good to see you. Uh, see we you crossed at Princeton, so I'm I'm glad to connect with you again. Uh, I Just a follow-up question to what Chip said. Um, is there anything that is consistent? Like, is, is a joke like, I mean, like, I love that joke. I think it's hilarious. I would have also told it. Um, is there anything that is always, um, you know, beneath uh, the pulpit or not, not ever appropriate? Or is it really just con by context? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, uh, uh, this is the problem with studying stand-up comedy. It, like, as you go through it, you can kind of check, like, what, could I ever say that? Like, in any concrete context, could I tell this joke? Like, especially, you know, there's so much in contemporary comedy about sex and, um, you know, we, we are sexual beings and that's something to celebrate. But, you know, in our tradition, we wear robes, right? <laughs> like, we cover up our bodies. So, so, so yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't apply everywhere because I've heard Nadia Bols Weber and, and her context say some things that I would never have been able to say in any of the contexts where I've served. So, so part of it is just thinking about what the ethos of the, of the place is. And then, and then also to think about what, what are the goals of, of this? Um, you know, so I, I love Chip's joke. I, I thought it was, it, it was really a, a safe joke, uh, even though it was talking about bodily functions. It, it wasn't explicit, right? It was, uh, you can intuit, you know, what, what's happening. And, and part of the joy is in that intuiting, right? It's, you know, not, not so laid out there. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that we could say there's any like absolutes in this. Um, but, but I think everything, you know, the more we know our folks and the more they know us and they know the kind of personalities that we have, uh, the more that we can, you know, bring that into our preaching. Uh, I think, uh, I, uh, Susan Sparks, who is a friend of mine, she, she pastors in New York City, and she's also a stand-up comic. So she's a Baptist female preacher and a stand-up comic. Um, so she brings, she kind of bridges these worlds. And, and as a side note, she has a great book called Preaching Punchlines. And that, that has a lot of practical wisdom. And it's like, her, for her big thing, like our comedy emerges from our, our, our pastoral personas. So you know, just like all of our preaching, I, I think people want to see our authentic selves up there, albeit a re refined self, right? We don't want to just, you know, shoot from the hip every, every week. But, um, but, you know, if we're telling jokes, it's just a part of our personality at the church fellowship, you know, at the, the youth lock-in, where, whatever, we, wherever we find ourselves, then I think we're setting the, the stage for us to then bring that more into our preaching. Uh, if we're very serious people, um, and then we start trying to tell jokes, uh, th then I think that homiletical wisdom to like, if you're not funny already, then don't try to, to try these things. Uh, and, you know, we, we can test some things out with people. You know, you call a couple of people in the church and say, I was thinking about talking about this on Sunday. Let, let, me, let me run through it and get your feedback. Um, and, and, you know, maybe picking a couple of different demographic groups to, to try something. Um, uh, but, I think in, in general, like I tend to think about Aristotle in this way, you know, the, the first uh, maxim is to do no harm. And then the second maxim that follows it is to approach the good. So if we're going to so alienate people and cause them to stop listening to all the things we might say after the joke, then I think that would be grounds to like, it's, it's, it's not going to be appropriate. Um, but, you know, also just a joke for a joke's sake, just to kind of make people like us, like, uh, 
I, I personally am kind of opposed to the the dad joke at the beginning of a sermon to kind of like warm warm up the audience. Uh, uh, I feel like if you're going to tell a joke at the beginning, like that should carry through and come back in the end in some way, so that it it achieves that feeling of of uh, completion, you know, where we see that it was already doing that important work. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I'd love for it to hear more about you know how you found uh, the, the lines being drawn in, in your, in your con context? It's a great question. I have one. Uh, just recently, I did a sermon on the road to Emmaus. And when Jesus came upon them, I like to play on words. I feel that's a lot safer if you do a moaner with a play on words. And uh, when Jesus came upon them, they had their faces downcast and they were looking down. And when you look down, you see defeat. And so they were defeated. Ba -bum -bum. Yeah, and, and yeah then, that's the thing. <laughs> you get the groan. <laughs> yeah, that's a groaner. And then right after that, they asked Jesus, were you the only one that don't know, didn't know what was going on in, and I have slides up behind me, and I had a picture of an iron and a knee, which showed that that was an iron knee. <laughs> Jesus was the only one that really knew what was going on, and nobody else did. So uh, those were two, and then we got to the serious part, but that was at the beginning of it, and it was relative of what were going on. The people were defeated, and they didn't know what was going on, so there was irony. Thank you, Herb. That's a great setup for the next uh, next bit of what we're going to talk about. Um, all right, so so uh, when we think about using jokes in in, in the, the pulpit, um, th there's so much that we can draw upon, right? That we've already talked about ways in which we can, you know, be a little bit self-effacing, not so much that it it distract detracts from what we're trying to say, right? The subject of our sermons is God, not us, um, but our lives can be, you know, helpful um, pointers to, to bear witness to, to what God is doing in the world. And um, I'm really interested in, in the comedy that, that moves from ha-ha to aha. It, it's this, this, this movement to thought. Um, and, and I want to give you a couple of, of quotes that I've found helpful. Uh, George Carlin, we talked about him earlier. This is what he said. He said, laughter is that disarming moment or disarmed moment when something strikes us and we laugh without even knowing it, trying it or being able to prevent it, it just happens. And he says, no one is more himself, herself, themselves in the moment when they're laughing at a joke. It's in those moments that people's defenses go down. And that's when you can slip in, oops, typo, sorry, slip in a good idea. So if the good joke carries a good idea, the entrance is open at that moment. Uh, this is a big this was a big insight for me when I when I saw this because a lot of Carlin's comedy it's very obscene right and 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 it's shock comedy right he, he's coming out of the tradition of Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor where they're saying things that in polite conversation like don't have any place right but also there are these moments that that he's slipping in these ideas he's challenging you know our assumptions about the world so, so that's one of the kind of guiding kind of impulses for me. Another quote I'd like to read is from, uh, from Chris Rock. And um, he, there's this great documentary called Dying Laughing that's it's on Netflix. And, and, and he talks about how the standard rhythm of a joke is, you know, the setup and then the punchline and the laughter. So it's just like boop, boop, boop movement to, to most comedy sets. But he said he doesn't like that. He, he likes to have uh, a punchline that leads to a laugh at one moment. And then maybe the next giant, uh, punchline would lead to booing and then the next one would lead to like a, a laughter and then maybe the next one would be a gasp uh, and, and I thought this is really a helpful way to kind of keep people on their toes and it going building off of what Carlin says uh, and, and what some of you have already said that when people are set at ease and they're laughing um, then we're open to a new insight so if the if the the punchline or that maybe we have a maybe a false pulse uh, punchline that causes laughter and then the next then we take a beat and then the next word is something that's like oh wow you're you're challenging some of my 
you know, sacred cows. Like you're, you're coming after my ideologies. That's an opportunity that I think we have as preachers. Uh, another comic I, I really like is Bobby Wilson. He's a, a part of a comedy troupe of Native Americans called the 1491s. He said, what upsets people most is comedy that speaks truth in between the lines. And with those people, <clears throat> if you think the world is like perfect and you think that it's uh, uh, going great for everyone, comedy is probably not for you because a lot of the best stuff is pointing out all the stupid shit. And uh, I, I love this line. And, and, and he, he does, he, he exemplifies this in his comedy. You can check him out on YouTube if you haven't heard of him. But uh, a lot of what he's doing is um, participating in certain stereotypes about Native Americans. And then there's this flip, there's this reversal. It's, a, it's like, it's kind of a parabolic movement, you know, to, to follow the way Jesus told stories that upsets our expectations. And in those moments where we're uh, a little uncomfortable when he's slipping the truth in between the lines, as it were, that's when people are able to see the world in a new way. Um, so, so that's a really helpful line. And the last one I want to talk about is from a, a comic called Amanda Seals. Uh, she's a brilliant comic and she has an HBO special called I Be Knowing. And this is what she said. She said, I'm not interested in making everybody laugh. I'm more interested in making everyone learn. I want some people to feel uncomfortable. I want them to shift in their seats. I want to make some people cry. And, and, and I bring these four kind of quotes together just to kind of help guide our, our, our quest, you know, so you can do this at home. You can watch some Netflix comedy specials and think about, okay, what is this comic doing? And, and, and this allows us to move away from the content, right? Because we've already talked about some of the content is inappropriate uh, from the church if we want to keep our jobs, uh, especially, you know, people really will have a hard time if we want to talk about our sex lives in the pulpit, you know, that would probably be uh, verboten. Uh, but if we can think about ways that we can learn from the form that their comedy takes, uh, using narratives in certain ways where we're telling a story and along the way there are these like points of laughter, uh, but then at the end, there's a, a moment for reflection that causes us to see things in a new way. Uh, that's really exciting to me. All right, now let's, let's move on to think about the, this bigger question is, is this, is comical subversion possible? And there are different opinions about this. And it's something that I encourage you to think about for yourself. So let me lay out a few uh, of the arguments for and against. So uh, some people who say, yes, comical subversion is possible. Uh, they, they talk about joking as a, as a tiny revolution that can serve political and moral purposes. And uh, one of the things, there's this, uh, this book uh, uh, by uh, Chatu and Feldman. Uh, it's called A Comedian and an Activist Walk Into a Bar. Uh, it's, it's really great, but one of them is a comedy scholar and the other one is a stand-up comic. Um, I'm sorry, one of them is a sociologist, the other one is a, a comedy scholar. I, so they're, they're working together uh, in their stand-up. And they, they talk about how uh, when a joke is told that um, points at something like, uh, you know, climate change or, or global poverty, these, these big issues, like a lot of the comedy we see in Hasan Minaj's comedy, um, it, even if it doesn't lead people to like leave the church and then drive home and start writing letters to their Congress people, it, 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 because it's enjoyable, it gives greater exposure to issues that, you know, people might tune us out if it's like a long diatribe about, you know, you know, global warming or something. But if we can find ways to use humor, then that can cause people to, to know more about an issue and can take that kind of seriously. So that's one of the things that people who really promote the use of satire and political comedy or uh, the use of comedy that, that, that you know, points to injustices in the world is that it brings exposure and it helps people to receive something that maybe they wouldn't wanna receive if it was just given in a very kind of flat, dry way. At the same time, there are some comedy scholars who say no, that comedy leads people to laugh and it might be lead people to think, but it won't do that third thing that, Arist that Augustine talked about, which is leading people to, to, to live differently in the world, to change their, their behaviors. Uh, Wiley Cipher is a, a comedy scholar, and, and this is what they say. One of the strongest impulses comedy can discharge from the depths of the social self is our hatred of the alien, especially when the stranger who is different 
stirs any unconscious doubts about our beliefs. So Cypher looks at the way that so much comedy uh, requires uh, a certain level of participation in uh, you know, biases and uh, prejudices about a certain group or another. And, and this is one of the, the benefits of comedy in general is it can, it can fortify in-group cohesion. So if we tell a joke and it's, it's all of us insiders and we can all laugh about that together, it, it you know, bolsters our sense of identity as a group. Whereas so much comedy tends to do that at the expense of other groups, right? So comedy that, that resorts to minstrelsy. So it, uh, you know, it takes on a certain accent or a certain pattern of behaving in order to, to punch down somebody else. Uh, that's a problem that is really just reinforcing ideologies and prejudices that don't actually lead us to, to do things uh, in, in a new and, and more faithful way. Uh, another scholar I've really found helpful is a, a lady named Alenka Zupancic, who is a Slovenian uh, psychoanalytic philosopher. So uh, if you really want to do a deep dive into, into the work of Jacques Lacan, <laughs> she, she's, she's the one to look at, but she's written a lot about humor and comedy as well. And she tells this, this joke that I, I wanna share with you. Um, she said, and this was a, a popular joke during apartheid in South Africa. So she said, a violent fight starts on a bus between black people sitting in the back and white people sitting in the front. So the driver stops the bus, makes everyone get out and lines them up in front of the bus. And he yells at them, stop this fight immediately. As far as I'm concerned, you are all green now. People of the lighter shade green, please uh, get in the front of the bus and people of the darker shade green, get in the back. And, and one of the things she illustrates in that joke is that it just reinforces uh, these, these, the, the differences that, that are already present. It doesn't actually challenge the system itself. Um, so, so here's where you know, the, the call for identity politics to be uh, kind of hardwired into our comedy, I think is really true, is that sometimes by uh, making light of a, a, of a situation, what we can do is bring harm to those people who are already in a vulnerable space by virtue of their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, political persuasion, like all of those things. And M. Conrad Hires, who uh, is a you know, theologian and comedy scholar, uh, he's written a lot about comedy and, and theology. He makes the point that you know, comedy was a huge part of Stalinist Russia. And that all the jokes that were being told, they, everything was permittable as long as it was making fun of the democratic Western uh, powers. So we can see ways that, that comedy can, you know, just reinforce the ideology uh, of the day. Um, and then the last point I'd like to make uh, on these, these lines, um, and this is a good conversation with my friend Chuck Campbell uh, at Duke. Uh, and he wrote a really great book uh, with uh, Johan Siliers from South Africa called Preaching Fools that uh, was published a few years ago. Uh, it's a really insightful read. But Chuck's big emphasis is that he really leans into this idea of preaching, preaching being a foolish task. So really leaning into what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 uh, about the foolishness of the gospel and it's a stumbling block. And, uh, and so he sees the, the preacher performing the role of the buffoon or the, the jokester or the trickster that's subverting the powers of principalities. Uh, so, so he sees that as a, as a great you know, moment to say, yes, here's where comedy can be really helpful. But others, other comedy scholars have pointed out that sometimes the, the whole uh, notion of a, of a festival or a carnival where um, some of these role reversals take place, where it's the one place where you're allowed to make fun of the king, uh, it, what it does is it just creates a, a moment of respite and then everything goes back to the way it was. So there's a live question on whether uh, it, that comedy that is trying to be subversive can actually subvert these structures or whether it might, you know, possibly like reinforce those, those structures. So one person I think is a really helpful kind of test case for us to think about is John Oliver. Uh, he's the, the host of Last Week Tonight uh, with John Oliver on, on HBO. And if you're, you're familiar with his, his comedy, he really tries to blend um, stupidity and seriousness. So he keeps us always on our toes. You know, he'll tell us a bunch of stupid, stupid jokes, 
And then there's this moment where he's getting really serious and really emphatic about some issue. And one of the interesting things in one of his early episodes, he did an expose on the bail bond system in New York City, kind of exposing the history of it and talking about how it you know, really can, can hurt uh, you know, certain, certain people groups. And, uh, and you know, he has, he has a bunch of jokes that, that he kind of weaves uh, in, into this. Um, you know, uh, one of the jokes he uses in that, that special or that series is on, uh, he said, uh, being in prison can, be, can do to your, your life what being in the band could do to your social life. <laughs> um, you know, just being in for a little bit of time can, you know, ruin the whole rest of it, uh, he said. Uh, no offense to anyone who's in the band. But... Um, but he tries to use this silly kind of asides to then to keep our attention, one, but then also to drive home some important fact. Well, after this, this special on bail bonds ended, there was such a huge outcry against uh, de Blasio and what was happening in New York City that they actually started to regulate the bail bond system uh, in New York. So so proponents of using comedy to affect social change or political change would say, look at this, John Oliver is showing us how to do it. But then others would say like, well, did it really change? You know, maybe it changed for a minute, but then things just kind of go right, go right back. Um, so, so yeah, so these are some things I wanted to get on the table for us to, to talk about. And, and the question is, um, for me is, how might the comical support the work of preaching in your context? So I'd love to hear you just kind of reflect on ways that, that you might employ this mixture of stupidity and seriousness to, to challenge systems of injustice, to challenge, uh, you know, sins that are taking place in your community. Uh, let me stop sharing so that we can, we can chat about it a bit. Yeah, Doug. I'm reminded of Kurt, what Kurt Vonnegut said about jokes pointing out the difference between the world as it should be and as it is. And how we, you know, he, he talks at length about that in his in Palm Sunday. Um, it's, he talks about Jesus' joke about the poor will always be with you as a holy joke. Hmm. I yeah. think there's uh, there are opportunities there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for talking about that. Uh, to follow up on that, there's a guy named Simon Critchley who wrote a book called On Humor. Uh, he's a British philosopher who teaches at um, in New York City now. But that was that's his big thing is that comedy can help us imagine possibilities that we didn't know existed, right? Because we're so inculcated in certain ways of thinking that we think. The poor will just be with us. Like it's almost like if you read it one way, Jesus is just shrugging, like, yeah, the poor will always be with you, therefore to do nothing. Or to think about it in a comical, subversive sense, you know, maybe it's challenging us to, to do something about that. Great point. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Philip. I just had a question. It is really hard for me to make fun of things that are not funny. Mm. You know, that, that poor, that poor, the, Jesus talking about the poor. Um, I, I don't see it as a joke. I, I think he was talking about an Old Testament passage. The poor is always with you, meaning you should always help them. Not that you should ignore them. Yeah. Uh, so it's just not funny to me. Yeah, thank you, Philip. That's a really great thing to talk for us to talk about. Um, there are certain texts where I've you know done the exegesis on them, and a, a commentator might say, "Look how funny this is." I'm like, "Well, I don't like maybe I'm not reading it right, but I don't see it as all that funny." You know, part part of the problem is that humor is so uh, culturally situated. You know, if you've ever had to try to like explain a joke to someone from a different place um, that, you know, is a, is a real thing. Uh, in fact, as a side note, I don't know if you remember this um, American Express commercial that ran in the late 90s, early 2000s with Jerry Seinfeld. And, and the commercial illustrates this perfectly for me because the beginning of the, of the commercial, it shows Jerry on stage telling a joke 
And the joke is about the seventh inning stretch in baseball, but he's in the UK and he tells the joke and it just, it's just crickets, you know, silence. And then the rest of the commercial shows him using his American Express card to, to hang out at the meat mongers, listening to people and out on the cricket pitch and learning all the arcane uh, terminology uh, that, that he didn't know about. And then the joke, the commercial ends with him telling a joke that is so colloquially British. I didn't even, I can't even make sense of what he was talking about. But the response is that people are roaring with laughter. Uh, and and um, I'll be interested. Um, there's a book that's coming out uh, in July, written by uh, Dr. Rolf Jacobson at Luther Seminary that he wrote with his brother. It's called Divine Laughter. And it's a book that is really trying to look at humor in, in the Bible. Um, so my argument has been, I don't think the Bible is all that funny, um, just personally, but hopefully uh, the Jacobsons will cause me to see some, some ways of thinking about that that I hadn't, hadn't thought about. But thank you for that. Any other thoughts, insights? I guess I would just reinforce that humor is often very regional and cultural sensitive. My, my Oli and Lena jokes work fine in Minnesota, but in Ohio, they fall flat, you know, and that's just a fact. And you have to adjust to some of that too. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, my first call uh, was in a small town called Henrietta, North Carolina. Uh, there was no stoplight. It had one stop sign. It was a super, super small church. And uh, I thought, well, because I live most of my life in Jacksonville, Florida, which is still pretty south, that there wasn't going to have to be any translation of any of these things. So when I started preaching there and things that I had thought would be at least a, I, at least to earn a little chuckle, it, it, yeah, it, did, it didn't go over so well. Uh, but, you know, as I got to know the folks better and got to hear stories, then then, you know, the humor was able, my humor was able to connect with what they found funny. But yeah, thank you for illustrating that. That's, that's important. <laughs> Any other thoughts before we move forward? Sunday, I'm preaching um, from Second Timothy. <clears throat> and the title of my sermon is Yo Mama. And um, the point of me using that as the title because it talks about <clears throat> Paul giving, you know, a shout out really to um, Timothy's mom, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. And I thought, oh, yeah, we always hear these your mama jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're usually offensive, sometimes hilarious, sometimes true. But to, to try to shift people's thinking when they hear your mama, instead of hearing it in a negative way, think about your mama Lois, mm. your, your mama Eunice, and how they instill sincere faith in you. So hopefully that works. If uh, I lose my job, Jacob, we will be talking. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> hoping that I can do justice to that so that people can see your mama, not as something like fighting words, but as thinking about the women who instill you know, the good in us and yeah. faith in us. So. Yeah, we'll thank see. you, Carmen. I, I want to hear that sermon. That sounds like we'll there's a see. lot of possibilities there. I, it reminds me of something that, that I read in Frank Thomas's writing um, that, that I found so helpful is to talk about this concept of the dozens, uh, which is, uh, he, he looks at like, especially in African-American rhetoric, this ways in which there are, there's the, the denotative and the connotative difference. And then, and part of that isn't necessarily derogatory, but it's just a part of like creating an atmosphere of like community and it's drawing people into that, that space. Uh, so, you know, using the yo mama jokes and whether you're gonna actually use any of the jokes. Uh, and there's probably some that would be inoffensive enough to, to pass. There's probably some that you definitely wouldn't wanna use, uh, but that's a great way to kind of flip the expectations, right? Because Paul's doing very much the opposite there, you know? you know, celebrating, you know, the, the role these women had in, you know, raising Timothy in the faith. So yeah, that's a great illustration. All right, let me keep going because uh, I realize our time is slipping away. Um, so I wanted to 
to look at a few exemplars and just kind of think about the ways that they use the humorous and the comical in, in, their, in their comedy. Uh, one great uh, illust illustration of this is uh, Dick Gregory, um, you know, great civil rights leader, stand-up comic. And he was, he was really the first uh, black comic to perform in white clubs. So he was very much the outsider, the other in these spaces. And a lot of the jokes that he used, especially early in his uh, comedy career, were um, they, he was taking jabs at the systems of injustice, um, but he was using humor in order to, uh, to, to challenge the, the structures, but in a way that kind of, he kind of slips in these things. Like, uh, so for instance, he has one joke where he says, segregation is not all bad. Have you ever heard of a collision where the people in the back of the bus got hurt? So, and remember, this is during segregated, you know, Jim Crow, you know, time period. Um, but it's a way to like point out the systemic inequities that are taking place in society, but to find humor in it that can be a little subversive. Um, he has another joke where he said, uh, last time I was down South, I walked into this restaurant and this white waitress came up to me and said, we don't serve colored people here. I said, that's all right. I don't eat colored people. Bring me a whole fried chicken. Uh, so, so that's another illustration where it just, that's just uh, what joke scholars would say. That's like, he's just playing on words that, you know, we have, and there's lots of ways that we can do this in, with biblical passages. Um, the, the last joke that, that I'll mention is he says, uh, he starts a bit where he says, I love baseball. And, and he's telling this in America. And we know that you know, baseball was kind of unrivaled as America's pastime back in, you know, the, the, the late 50s, early 60s. And, and he says, I love baseball because it's the only sport in America or the only time in America where a black man can wave a stick at a white man and not start a riot. Uh, and it's, it's part of a longer bit on Willie Mays. And, um, and part of it, like, you can laugh at it, but then it, it starts to work on you and you start to think about it. Um, you know, like about the, the injustice that, it, that the joke is, is pointing to. So, so that's one way I think we might use uh, the humorous and the comical in our preaching is, is to tell a joke that immediately grabs hold of the, the assumptions and biases of the congregation, but then there's a subtle subversion that, that, that comes at, at the end, end of the joke. Uh, another person uh, who we can look to is Dave Chappelle. Uh, now he's gotten in a lot of uh, trouble uh, for certain things that he, that he has said, but he's a really great uh, exemplar of uh, ideological provocation. Um, so so he's, he's poking the bear and the bear most often for him would be, you know, racism uh, and, and, and really white supremacy in, in America. And he, he has a couple of his last comedy specials where he's talking about um, the ways in which um, the transgender uh, advocacy like has, has risen to prominence because there's this huge overlap between those pushing for transgender rights and white people. And, and so he has like a series of jokes um, and a couple of his last specials where he's, he's, he's trying to point out the um, the incongruity between, you know, certain assumptions that are used to bolster transgender rights, and that if those same principles are applied to how African Americans are treated, that, that it falls apart and it doesn't work. Um, now, he's gotten a lot of criticism, you know, for doing this, and rightly so, right? There, there should be some pushback. But I think he the content aside, he gives us an opportunity to think about how we can, can, can push against uh, ideological structures and to challenge those with, with the use of, of humor. Uh, another person to look at is Wanda Sykes. Uh, she is a brilliant uh, stand-up comic, uh, hilarious, and she really moves back and forth between uh, just straight up humor and humor that kind of has a subversive uh, bent to it. Um, she has uh, this, like one of her most famous uh, bits, um, and I know this will be on YouTube and, you, and this is a group of pastors, but I'm just gonna say it because of the way she says it, but um, she talks about wishing that she had a detachable pussy. 
And she has this long bit about that and starts to think about the benefits that would come along with that. But if you, it's another one of those series of jokes that if you start to think about it, you realize that what the, the comedy is aimed at is the objectification of women, the, um, the perversive, uh, pervasive male gaze and the ways in which that uh, puts women at risk and, and, and challenges them. So his, uh, her, so her whole comedy kind of really plays off of irony and she, she even dabbles in satire and a lot of her, her comedy. Um, so I encourage you to, to take a, a look at her work. Um, she's led uh, one scholar named Amber Day, um, who's a political theorist, um, to talk about this concept called satire activism. So it's combining satire and activism to come together in ways that, you know, Sykes is one of a, a series of kinds of people who help us to, to challenge uh, some of these systems and, and structures. Another person I'd like us to think about is Daniel Sloss. Uh, he has one Netflix special, but he's got two of them on HBO. And he's a Scottish comic and uh, his, his, um, his uh, persona is he's kind of like a, a wise fool or he's kind of buffoonish. <laughs> so when he starts to tell the jokes, um, it's, it's like frat guy jokes. Like a lot of them are just stupid. They're all connected with bodily functions and mishaps and, and things, but he uses those or he intersperses those throughout his comedy sets to challenge some, you know, huge, you know, issues like, you know, sexual violence. And he uses himself a lot as the, the test case, both as a illustration of how dumb humans can be, but also as a way in which, despite his efforts to be, you know, uh, pro-feminist, to, to advocate for friends, he still participates in these ways of thinking that lend themselves to the continued, you know, violence against, against women, even if he isn't personally uh, doing any of these things. So he's another person I would encourage you to, ch to check out because he's doing it in a way that's, that's very, very, very unique. And uh, it's, it's got a Hannah Gadsby-esque kind of uh, movement between, you know, silliness and, and really, you know, direct uh, critique. And then the last one I'd like to think about is Margaret Cho. Uh, she's had a great evolution to her comedy career. Um, you know, so much of her work uh, has been drawing upon her experience as a Korean American woman, um, and you know, and she does something that that there that a lot of comedy scholars would maybe challenge, which is this idea of minstrelsy. So sometimes she uh, imitates her mom using a like a, a very kind of uh, you know uh, stereotypical uh, Asian accent um, that some would say, no, you're just reinforcing those racial stereotypes, and that's a problem. But another thing that she's doing is, you know, uh, we might call this about like, like she's queering uh, bodily identity. So she uses uh, herself uh, in a lot and, you know, as, as most comics do in her routines, but she's not only challenging the ways in which uh, certain uh, body images are held up as the standard, you know, particularly like a, a white, you know, blonde haired kind of image of feminine beauty that she doesn't embody, but she's not just making a case for why she, uh, you know, ought to be considered beautiful in her own right, but she's subverting the whole thing through humor. So uh, I encourage you to, to take, a, take a look at that. You know, she has these, uh, you know, great, totally raunchy jokes that you could never <laughs> tell in, in, in church, but uh, she off also offers kind of a, a framework for us to think about how we could you know, use our own embodied realities to, to spur people to laugh, but also in those moments of laughter to challenge and subvert uh, the structures that, 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 that continue to, to guide our living. All right, let me stop sharing so we can see what, if there are any final uh, insights or, or comments that, that you all have. I'd, I'd love to hear anything that has, has, uh, this has spurred in you to, to think about and to, to maybe use in your preaching ministry. Yeah, Dwight. Uh, Jake, I wanted to ask, thank you for doing this today, by the way, appreciate you. I um, wanted to ask, have you ever taken a uh, point where you've taken the main point of the sermon and written a joke about whatever the main point of the text is and then built around that? 
and instead of trying to integrate a joke into the sermon, maybe spinning the joke out of the sermon and trying to give it like that arc we were talking about, a story that ends up coming somewhere with a callback. Have you written from a joke as the central point? Yeah. And if so, I, I, any recommendation on that? Yeah, thank you for that, Dwight. And it was great getting to chat with you because you're you're a stand-up comic and a and a preacher. So you know, you're definitely somebody to to learn from in this space. And, and I've never I've never done stand-up. I've never gotten on stage and tried to do it. I had actually dabbled in thinking about doing that, uh, but then the pandemic hit and I haven't <laughs> haven't you know done that because all the comedy clubs have been closed. But I gotta say it terrifies me to think about about doing that. Um, but yes, there there are ways that um, yeah, especially I found using like observational humor to just kind of play out like what ifs about things that, that have, have kind of emerged. So it's humor that I found that um, is more reflective on maybe the disparities between what the text is saying and, and how I live my life or or things that I see going on in our society. But it so it's not jokes in the sense it's more uh, what you know comedy theorists would say it's a bit. And, you know, in a bit, like every joke is a bit, but not every bit is a joke. So like a bit can be a longer narrative piece. And here we might think about like this movement between engaging the text and then reflecting on the world and then moving back into the text and then reflecting on the world where the, the incongruities can play out, um, you know, and, and you can kind of create a space for, for that. But Dwight, I'm sure you have a lot better examples than, than I do since you use this in your, your preaching ministry. No, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll listen. I'm not seeing any uh, hands or any any questions. Um, so what I'll just you know, say is that this is just another tool that you can put into your homiletical tool belt. And just like, you know, studying, you know, like narrative and like how to tell stories. And not only does that connect us with the narrative structure of a lot of, of, a lot of our biblical texts, but it helps us to think about the structure of sermons itself. So like, for instance, um, you know, Eugene Lowry's work on the homiletical plot he he pushed uh, you know right when narrative preaching was at its heyday he pushed against the idea of just plopping stories into our sermons but to to use narrative structure to think about how the sermon as a whole moves you know so there's this like initial problem that's presented there's rising tension there's a moment where things move one way and then there's this kind of denouement uh, experience uh, I I'm hoping that my book on stand-up preaching can can begin to help us think not so much about just plopping jokes into the sermons, but to think about a comical structure to the whole of our sermons. Um, and, you know, we, we can think about it, you know, as a way to add to our preaching that is aimed at, you know, making the world a more just and equitable place, but to think about the way humor and, and the comical can help to, to facilitate that work. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's uh, the work that I've had. If we don't have any final questions, then then Chip, are, are there any closing questions or thoughts that you might have for us? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Jake. This is um, I learned something every one of these workshops, but I feel like um, this one in particular, I have really been grateful. I'm seeing some people giving some happy hands, so let's give Jake mm -hmm. some happy hands to thank him for his great thank work. Um, I think. Um, one thing that just impresses me so much, you have this encyclopedic knowledge of all of these different scholars and all of these different sources that have helped you. You're so um, gracious in commending them to us. And also I was like um, very tempted to update my Netflix and HBO Max like playlist um, while you were going on with all these great suggestions for comics too. So um, <laughs> maybe that's not what you were going for, but that's one of the takeaways that I had. So. Thank you very, very much. I'm really grateful um, for your time and for what you taught us. And I um, you know I remember praying at the beginning that we would be better preachers at the end than at the beginning. And I feel like I've learned so much that's helped me in that regard. And I know that others here have too. So Jake, thank you very, very much. 
And everyone will be back next month. Again, um, we have Teresa Fry Brown from Emory University talking about Osei. Can you see visual images in a saturated world? So look forward to seeing you then. And you're getting some comments. Thank you, Jake. So I want to make sure you see those. And um, thank you, everybody. I um, wish you Godspeed and um, see you next month. Thank you. Hi, everyone.